modern translations of the Bible, the word Moriah is used only twice. Genesis 22, 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. 2 Chronicles 3, 1 Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, for which provision had been made in the place of David, in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So we see Moriah is the name of the mountain, which name itself translates as consecrated by the Lord, upon which Abraham sought to sacrifice his son to Elohim, his Lord God, and that it was upon this same mountain that the wise king of the Jews, Solomon, would, fifteen generations later, build his temple to Abraham's Lord God. First, let us follow the travels of Abraham during his era to establish the location of Mount Moriah, where, later, Solomon would construct his temple. The Book of Jubilees states that Ur was founded in 1688 Anno Mundi, Year of the World, by Ur, son of Kesed, presumably the offspring of Arphaxad, adding that in this same year, wars began on earth. And Ur, the son of Kesed, built the city of Ara, of the Chaldees, and called its name after his own name and the name of his father, i.e. ur Kasdim. Jubilees 11.3 so we find that the most likely place of Abraham's birth and early formative youth was in ur Kasdim, a city-state in Sumero, Acadia, on the coast of the Persian Gulf in its time, founded during the Ubiad period, 5,800 years ago or so, on the south shore of the southernmost Euphrates River, modern-day Iraq. We are told in Seder Olam that Abraham was the firstborn son of Terah, and the Talmud infers the date of Abraham's birth to have occurred in 1948 Anno Mundi, circa 1813 BC. While in Ur Kasdim, according to rabbinical tradition and Zohar, as well as in Muslim Quran, where Terah is called Azar, Abraham, then called Abram, quarreled with his father Terah, an idolatrous priest, according to Midrash Haggadol, who owned a shop selling graven images of the Sumerian pantheon. According to Rabbi Hia, in Genesis Rabbah, Terah left Abram to mind the store while he departed, a woman came with a plateful of flour and asked Abram to offer it to the idols. Abram then took a stick, broke the idols, and put the stick in the largest idol's hand. When Terah returned, he demanded that Abram explain what he'd done. Abram told his father that the idols fought among themselves and the largest broke the others with the stick. Why do you make sport of me? Terah cried. Do they have any knowledge? Abram replied, Listen to what you're saying. The Tanakh, in Genesis 11, explains to us how Abraham, then still called Abram, left ur Kasdim with his wife and half-sister Sarai, his brother Nahor II, and his nephew Lot, and their patriarch Terah, and how the family altogether settled in the city of Haran, 
a Hurrian city in formerly Assyrian lands, presently called Turkey, far to the north of Sumero Acadia, in modern day Iraq. At the age of 205 years old, Terra, the family patriarch, died in the city of Haran. In Hebrew tradition, Abram left Haran prior to his father Terah's death. In Samaritan, Christian, and some Islamic traditions, Abram is said to have left Haran after Terah died. Abram left Haran with Sarai, his half-sister wife, and with Lot, his nephew, and they traveled to Shechem in Canaan, a land called now the Levant, and comprised of the Mediterranean coastal lands southward from Lebanon to the Egyptian Nile, and inland eastward to the Jordan River Valley. In Shechem, later the polity of Nablus, located in the Ephraim hill country between Mounts Ebal and Gerizim, near this Canaanite town Shechem, Abram made his first sacrificial offering to his Lord God, specifically in the hilly Moray plains south of Mount Tabor, among a grove of terebinth trees. It was here Abram built his first altar to his Lord God. Abram continued having visions of his Lord God, and his next experience has been recalled as Berith Bayin Habaratrim, or the covenant of pieces or parts, wherein his vision promises Abraham his descendants will rise up to rule the lands then occupied by ten different kingdoms, four hundred years after Abram's own lifetime. This vision of his Lord God occurred to Abram on Mount Betarim, one of the peaks of Mount Dove, along the modern border of Lebanon and Syria, between Sheba in Lebanon and Masada in former Syria, modern-day occupied Golan Heights. According to modern documentary hypothesis, the references to this event in modern Tanakh vary due to there being a plurality of scribal sources in ancient times when the text was first recorded. One, the Jawist scribe, always using the term Yahweh, meaning God. Another, the Elohist, always using the term Elohim, meaning my Lord as well as priestly scribal colophons made along the way. In Genesis 12 and 15, Abram's Lord God offers these lands as an unconditional covenant with Abram and his descendants. But in Genesis 17, this covenant is amended to stipulate all his descendants be marked by Brit Malah, circumcision, a form of ritual genital mutilation to be performed on infant males. When Abram was 99 years old, his Lord God proclaimed Abram's name to then be Abraham, meaning a father of many nations. In thanks for this event, Abraham circumcised himself and his firstborn son Ishmael, then aged 13, whom was born to their maidservant Hagar the Egyptian. When Abraham was aged 100 years, his second son was born, the firstborn to his half-sister wife, Sarai, and circumcised on his eighth day following birth. When this son of Abraham and Sarai, named Isaac, meaning, he will laugh, was around the age of 37, and Ishmael, presumably, was aged 51. Abraham exiled Ishmael and Hagar, attempted to sacrifice Isaac to his Lord God, and Sarai died, all in relatively rapid succession. 
Abraham, then aged 137 years, began a ritual commemorated to this day known as the Akedah, binding in Hebrew, of Isaac, or as the Dabi, slaughter in Arabic, of Ishmael, according to differing sources. According to the Hebrew Tanakh and the Christian Old Testament, Isaac was bound by his father Abraham, who was poised to make a living offering of his son to his Lord God, when, all of a sudden, a ram appeared and offered its throat to be cut instead of Abraham's sons. Probably simultaneously to this event, we are told Abraham cast out Ishmael and Hagar into the wilderness in Genesis 21, and they settled in the lands of Beersheba, where, according to Genesis 22, Abraham also later settled, and, according to Persian Arab Muslim historical and theological scholar Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Jarir al Tabari, writing in the early decades of the 8th century AD, Abraham continued to visit Ishmael and to give him paternal advice. According to legends recorded by by Al-Tabari, Abraham gave the black stone to Ishmael to complete the construction of the Kaaba in Mecca, and personally implemented the original Hajj pilgrimage there himself. Sarai died, and Abraham subsequently married a concubine named Ketera, and sired by her six sons. Abraham died at age 175 years and was buried, according to Genesis 25 and 1 Chronicles 1, by both his most favored sons, Isaac and Ishmael, together. Until only recently, the Tanakh was the only original source for descriptions of either Solomon or his temple. No archaeological evidence existed to confirm his existence, nor to refute the traditional religious beliefs about either. In late 2014 AD, Mississippi State University archaeologists excavating at Kiribit Sumali, an Iron Age 2A site in the south of modern Israel, uncovered a collection of six bulai or official clay seals dating from around at least 900 BC, Gregorian. King Solomon, if he did exist, would have, as his positive regnal dates, 970 to 931 BC. Excavations beginning in 2009 at Telburna a possible match for the ancient lost city of Libna, discovered it had been more or less continuously inhabited throughout the Bronze and Iron Ages, although it would have been directly on the border between Judah and Philistia in the later Iron Age. Excavations at Telburna demonstrate that location to have been inhabited as long ago as 12,000 BC, and at least from the 800s to the 600s BC, continuously. According to biblical legend, the Temple of Solomon was destroyed in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar II. Telburna has at least one courtyard 52 squared feet in area. If indeed Telburna is Libna, a Levitical city which revolted in the 800s BC against Jehoram, 2 Chronicles 21, of the southern kingdom of Judah, established following King Solomon's death, citing that he had abandoned the god of his fathers, then why would it have been considered a pagan cult dwelling there by excavation director Itzhak Shai of Ariel University? 
possibly attributable to the Canaanite deity Baal or to the contemporary war goddess Anat. Countless strange artifacts have been uncovered at Tel Berna, which indicated to have been possibly a center for cultists of Baal. Dozens of vases, some the size of adult humans, votive statues with indistinct eroded features, a hieroglyphic inscribed Egyptian ivory scarab, triply combined goblets, and relics of masks or possibly clay death shrouds are among the variety of relics unearthed at Telburna. According to the 13th degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, Solomon's original choice for where to place his temple to the God of Abraham was near Jerusalem, but he found an older temple that had been built there already, which he, at first, falsely presumed to be of heathen origins. This earlier temple, discovered but mistaken for heathen by King Solomon, was, according to the Royal Arch Degrees History Lecture, actually built over the underground vaults of a much older temple than he had at first suspected, even predating the Great Flood. Solomon mimicked the architecture of this earlier temple from before the Great Flood in the architecture of his own temple and carved a sequence of nine subterranean vaults deeper and deeper into Mount Moriah, with the deepest vault being buried directly beneath the Holy of Holies in his first temple, and with a long and narrow tunnel hewn out of the rock leading from these vaults to the king's palace. Supposedly, it was in this ninth chamber vault the Ark of the Covenant was kept when it was not being venerated in the Holy of Holies, and in the mid-1900s, explorer Charles Warren apparently rediscovered this tunnel, although it remains considered only an underground waterway. The Standing Height Tunnel was finally done being cleared out in 1996. In 1 Kings 11 of Hebrew Tanakh and the Christian Old Testament, we are told Solomon's wives turned his heart after other gods, and that in particular he fell prey to attraction by Astoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites. Although we may assume Solomon consorted with as many devils as we like to imagine him doing so with, be it the 72 Goetia of the Shem Ham Farash, or be it only Asmodeus alone, then the king of demons. There is no canonical literary evidence of Solomon personally following after the Canaanite Baal. However, it is widely accepted now that at Shechem, the place of Abraham's first altar to his Lord God, Worship of Baal Barit, meaning the God of the Covenant, persisted at least until immediately following the death of Judge Gideon, Judges 6 through 8, and his refusal to be crowned king by them after his 40 years of peaceful rulings, when the Israelites turned to worshiping Baal Barith instead. According to the Muslim Quran, from the surah called Sabah, the faithful learned by Solomon's dying act that the jinn he naturally commanded were not all-knowing because with his last act of strength Solomon stood and leaning on his walking stick he died but remained standing so that none of the faithful nor the jinn knew he was dead until a termite ate away his staff and he collapsed. 
According to the scriptures, he died of natural causes at around 80 years of age. There are four presently known and widely accepted sources for the apocryphal book of Enoch. One Enoch is Ethiopian Enoch, only rediscovered to Western civilization by James Bruce, a Scottish traveler who visited Ethiopia from 1767 to 1773, but it was discarded and forgotten again until being translated from Ethiopian Gies into Latin and republished in the early 1800s. Two Enoch is Slavonic or Slavic Enoch and in this version survived in more than 20 manuscripts dating from the 1300s to 1700s, only becoming popularly discussed by scholars during the end of the 1800s. Three Enoch is Hebrew Enoch, or the book of Rabbi Ishmael, the high priest, and is attributed to Ishmael HaKohen, a high priest during the Second Temple era in Jerusalem, prior to 70 AD. The fourth source for the book of Enoch are Greek, Hebrew, and Coptic scroll fragments found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, kept from the 1st century AD until being rediscovered in the 20th century AD by Bedouin farmers in jars stored along the cliff-faced shores of the 34.2% salinity Dead Sea. While both 1 Enoch and 2 Enoch are thought to have originated from a single source, presumably the fragments of Enoch found in Coptic, Greek, and Hebrew among the Dead Sea Scrolls near Qumran. Three Enoch is unique from this trend in many ways. It seems to have been written at a time when it would have been easiest for its most probable author to have access to the contents of these Dead Sea Scrolls, including four Enoch, at a time in aeon prior to their being reduced to mere fragments as they are now. Portions of 1 and 2 Enoch, including the Book of the Watchers detailing the fall of the rebel angels, are suspected to date back to 200 to 300 BC. In 3 Enoch, Rabbi Ishmael, its author, describes Enoch being escorted on his first vision by the ministering angels Uzzah, Azza, and Azael. In 1 Enoch, and expanded upon in 4 Enoch's fragmentary sources, the archangel Uriel is Enoch's guide during his astronomical visions. In 1 Enoch, the characteristic archangels referred to to God amongst themselves as the Lord of Spirits, but in 3 Enoch, God is referred to religiously only as the Holy One, blessed be He. But though 1 Enoch may contain portions far more ancient in their origins, 3 Enoch is definitely a work of the early 1st century AD, era Hekalot, Throne, and Merkaba, Chariot literature. Although these may be the only sources of a truly autobiographical work by a pre-diluvial patriarch, there remain other biographical sources that describe events in Enoch's life. Some of these are intuitive, such as the exegesis on the Tanakh compiled into the Zohar, or the brief mention of his walking with God, and dying not, for God took him, in the words of Genesis 5 of Tanakh and the Old Testament. However, other references are less obvious, such as the connection mentioned before to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, or such as even a direct connection to Plato's descriptions of Atlantis. In the Zohar, once he has ascended as Metatron, 
Enoch is given 45 keys to the concealed engravings used by the supernal angels. In 3 Enoch, Enoch again having already ascended to become the Archangel Metatron, explains he has 70 names as well as the nickname of Youth. In Genesis, Enoch lived 365 years before being taken by God and ascended to become the Metatron. The name given to Enoch by his father, Jared, of the lineage of Seth, was the same as that given to Cain's firstborn son, Cain being the brother of Seth. Like the later Enoch of Sethite descent, Cain's son Enoch was a builder, but he was also the founder and ruler of a city by his name, established by Cain in the so-called Land of Nod, east of Eden. While Sethite Enoch lived 365 years, and then God took him, according to the canonized Vulgate, according to Josephus, contemporary historian to the Vulgate's canonization, Enoch, the son of Cain, had two wives and sired seventy-seven children. According to Jubilees 4.9, the wife of Cain and mother of this elder Enoch was named Awan. Although we are told in Genesis 5.21, Enoch begat Methuselah, no names of the wives of men for the lineage of Sethites have been provided. In the 13th degree of Scottish Rite Free and Accepted Masonry, the so-called Royal Arch Degree, the history lesson is given that Enoch the Sethite had had a vision and a dream of Mount Hermon, where the Watchers descended to earth and conspired to take unto themselves the wives of men. Led along by the voice of God, promising to reveal to Enoch his true name, Enoch journeys in the Masonic histories to the lands of Canaan, where he hired workmen to construct an underground vault of nine chambers, each deeper than the one before it, that would, thirty-four generations later, be rediscovered by King Solomon and mistaken for a heathen temple. Settling in a land we know only to be near Jerusalem, Enoch the Sethite hired on workers to dig the nine-chamber deep vault, housing in its lowest level the true name of God, engraved on a golden triangle, sunk into a cube of agate. Enoch the Sethite also hired these workers to craft two obelisks for him, according to Masonic traditions, one made of brass to survive a flood, and one made of granite to resist any amount of fire. As the story goes, Enoch inscribed on the granite pillar the location of his buried vault, containing the true name of God, and on the brass pillar was written, the rudiments of the arts and sciences. It is said, then, that after the flood destroyed the pillar of granite and washed away all trace of the buried true name engraved on the cube of agate, Noah rediscovered Enoch's brass pillar. We do not have the content for the original Scotch master degrees conferred at Temple Bar Lodge in 1733 in London, at Bath in 1735, or at the French St. George of the Observance No. 49 at Covent Garden in 1736. As we have no records of former holders of these titles prior to Etienne Morin, the first Grand Inspector, patent issued August 27, 1761, of his network of Ecossias lodges based out of La Cap Francais, northern French colony of Saint Domingue. 
modern Haiti. By the time the 25 degree Morin's right had become the order of Prince of the Royal Secret and issued their circular manifesto throughout the two hemispheres on December 4th, 1802, the probable motive for creating this rite in the first place, as well as the source for the original author's knowledge about Enoch, were most likely already lost. How the Scottish Rite came to venerate Enoch in its histories as early as 1733, when James Bruce wouldn't even find one Enoch in Ethiopia until 1773, some 40 years later, remains one of the great unsolved anomalies of Enochian research. Written down around 360 BC, Plato's excerpts on Atlantis, that legendary oceanic superpower from beyond the pillars of Hercules, in which ancient Athens alone could defeat them, encapsulated in two works, the Timaeus and Critias, were written later in Plato's career as an author, but described events that had happened very early on during his own youth, during the lifetime of his mentor, Socrates. In Plato's descriptions from memory of Socrates' discussion with Timaeus of Locri, Hermocrates and Critias, the grandfather of Critias of the Thirty Tyrants Affair. According to the contents of this narrative, recited by Critias and transcribed by Plato decades later, the Greek lawmaker Solon, credited as the father of Athenian democracy, and whom lived from around 638 to around 558 BC, had journeyed as a young man himself to Egypt. In the city of Sais, called Jo in the Egyptian, and said by Herodotus to have been the tomb of Osiris, within the Egyptian district of Sais, in the fifth gnome of the Canopic branch of the Nile River's western delta region, Solon was initiated into a cult of Neith. The Egyptian goddess Nut was one of the nine deity pantheon, called by the Greeks the Ennead, and worshipped in Heliopolis, previously called Lunu by the indigenous Egyptians, and the land of On in the Tanakh, who explained to him the myth of Atlantis glossing over an already abridged and distorted interpretation by either Plato, by Timaeus, or by them both, of Pythagoreanism, assigning elements to the five regular solids, later called the Platonic solids, etc. Critias then rejoins the history of the once great island continent of Atlantis in the subsequent book, named for him by Plato. Critias explains that 9,000 years before then, or roughly 12,500 years before now, there had been a great war with the Atlanteans, who had invaded as far as Etruria and Middle Italy and Egypt, when the Athenians of the era led an alliance force that, though it disintegrated, provided them cover long enough to push the Atlanteans back from Tyrrhenia and Egypt. Critias then quickly adds that, at a later time, the entire island of Atlantis sank into the ocean in a single day and night. As Critias begins to quote the words of Zeus, whose wrath was vented on Atlantis, the account abruptly cuts off in mid-thought and is not picked up again by its author in subsequent writings. The most important detail of this entire narrative, however, which should not be overlooked, is that, speaking on behalf of Solon, Critias described how the 
commands of Poseidon were inscribed by the first kings on a pillar of oral calcum, which was situated in the middle of the island at the temple of Poseidon. A partial fragment from Plato's Republic, written around 380 BC, had found its way into the Nag Hammadi Library of 12 leather-bound papyrus leaf Coptic language codices recovered from Chenoboskian in Egypt, dating to no later than the 4th century AD. Surely the authors or scribes of four Enoch's various language translations at Qumran had also heard of Plato's Atlantis. Assuming the descriptions of the dates in all these materials, as we should, are merely conflations, and taking them all for simply myths is wisest. However, due to the global prevalence of the flood myth in ancient mythopoeic historical accounts, spanning across hundreds of different cultures, many separated from each other and isolated from the majority of the rest, human curiosity about this period of our past history persists. So, what comparisons can be made between these ancient sources about the pre-diluvial era? From Plato, we learn that the pre-diluvial Atlanteans carved their laws on a pillar of orichalcum, a supposedly indestructible material that has, nevertheless, managed to entirely vanish from Earth's surface by now. From the 13th degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, we learn that Enoch the Sethite, who also lived before the Flood, also carved laws into indestructible pillars after his own style, and left these above ground to mark the nearby secret location of his buried nine-chamber vault. We are further told in the Royal Arch degree that Enoch buried a cubic agate stone there with an embedded gold triangle carved with the true name of God. Finally, this degree confers, this cube of agate was dug up from Enoch's original buried temple and transplanted to a location in a sacred vault beneath the Holy of Holies, under the first temple, presumably on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. However, from current archaeological records, we are discovering increased evidence for a thriving Iron Age civilization spread across the Levant with central rulership that may have operated from one single location, Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, but which was always meant to expand to include other temples, such as, in the Masonic tradition, of a Temple of Justice to be constructed over Enoch's vaults, and, possibly, ultimately, temples to the deities of foreign nations as well. The final recounting of matters in the ineffable degrees of the Scottish Rite asserts that the cube of agate remained buried in a sealed chamber beneath the Temple Mount from the time when Nebuchadnezzar raised the first temple in 587 BC until when the Knights Templar were formed in 1119 AD and agreed to help begin excavations of the area. But is Mount Zion even the location of Mount Moriah? Or were they digging in the wrong place all along? Locations other than Jerusalem that were active during the same era, such as Tel Berna, provide equally viable locations for such a temple. But if Solomon's temple, and thus Mount Moriah itself, are not located at Mount Zion in Jerusalem, then where else could they be? And, perhaps most importantly, from whom or where did Abraham acquire the Kaaba stone?